Hey, Ash here from All Things Dentistry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those unwritten hints and tips in dentistry. Today, we are, it's a special day. Every day is a special day, actually. Today's even more special because we're going to be talking about this tooth here, which is this tooth. But we're going to talk about two things. One, this is a really calcified pulp chamber. So that's, we're going to talk about getting into that. But we're also going to be talking about kind of what I've been taught and what we teach about how to do a, a, a decent pulpectomy, meaning that the patient comes in, you do your pulpectomy and the patient leaves and then has minimal symptoms afterwards and kind of kind of the tips that I've been taught and, you know, what we teach now. So, you know, let's get into it. So this tooth here, this patient presented literally today and he had symptomatic irreversible pulpitis on tooth number two, six with symptomatic apical periodontitis. Really awesome guy. His name's Trevor and Trevor presented. I mean, you can see we've got a fractured amalgam. It's my favorite restored material possible, but it's slowly dying with the, uh, maybe it's climate change is the problem, but we've got a, a, a fractured amalgam here, most likely leakage, because we're trying to think about, you know, first of all, why did this tooth, why does this tooth need an endodontic therapy? So it's, he has lingering cold sensitivity for up to a minute. He's got apical percussion pain. I'm kind of like, you know, probably not the best case. Arguably, you probably still could do a vital pulp therapy, but maybe better off just to do the endodontic therapy. And we didn't, we had limited time, so we're gonna do the pulpectomy. So I took my time during the pulpectomy to kind of, you know, let's, let's take a look and see what do these calcified teeth look like? Calcified pulp chambers, not so much the canals. So here we go, just, just before we get started with our number four long shank round burr, let's take a look at our radiograph. So we take a look, you take a PA, you know, patient presents, take a PA, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't see anything. Then what you do is, oh, actually, before I get started, so you take your PA, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't see anything. Where's the pulp chamber? I can see, you know, a mesial buccal canal, a distal buccal canal, and likely a palatal canal. Now I'm thinking like maybe that splits. And you're like, oh my gosh, I've got no space. But what you can do is take a bite wing. Now I'm just going to throw this in here because if you haven't taken a look at our course, allthingsendo.ca, this is this is now we upgrade it all the time. So this actually is going to be put in there and take a look at it. We've got a private Facebook page, which talks about, you know, it's a learning journey for everybody. And we take all these tips that we've learned and we put them together and we're going to build your confidence. We've got so many cases that people have just been able to achieve the things that they never thought they'd be able to do. And I'm so excited about it. I'm super grateful for all of you that watch and anybody, if you come and join us, it's, I, I, I hope you'll have the similar experience. So what you can do if you don't, you know, if you have that periapical radiograph, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't see anything because there's, uh, you know, metallic restoration. It's in the periapical radiograph is angled. So what you can do is you can take a bite wing. And I remember looking at this, I'm like, oh, wow, we've actually got space, but it's calcified. And I understand, you know, I was there, oh gosh, 20 years ago. Ooh. Um, you know, getting one of these cases, if the patient presents into your clinic, you know, you're in, you've been doing dentistry for one to three, five years, you know, like, wow, that's a calcified case. I don't know if I can do it. Well, I can tell you that they, they certainly are complicated, but I want to develop, I wanted to create this video so you can t kind of take a look as to see what, what exactly are things that we're looking for. So that's really the idea. And because if you don't feel comfortable finishing the case, say you're, you know, it, you're in a place where you don't have an endodontist to refer to, you are it. That is the intent of a lot of these videos. And let's go ahead and walk through some of the tips that I've been taught, I've kind of learned along the way, to help tackle these types of cases. So here's another, this is the set of the four bite wings that we usually take. And you can see what we're looking at. So we do have some space. It's not that dire. This is a, just a bit of a different angle. But certainly there is a calcification in here. But when I see this, I know that like, oh, well, we'll actually be, we're not going to get a drop. So I think that that's really important to know up front that you're not going to get a drop whatsoever. You're going to have to like, it's like skinning an onion almost. Like you kind of have to peel away layers of the pulp just above, take your time just above when you, and you, again, you're not going to drop in. You're going to have to have high, unfortunately, I've gotten, I've kind of dealt with this. You need high magnification for stuff like this, like. 3.5 or four loops, two is kind of not pushing it. It's kind of pushing it. And then you'll be able to kind of be able to see and then peel away, at least be able to get around some of this and get the patient out of some sort of misery. But we don't want to put them in more misery. Anyways, let's go ahead and let's get started with this case. 
All right, here we are. So we're using a number four long surgical burr. And the reason why we're using a long four number four surgical burr is to keep the head of the handpiece. You can see it's out of the way so I can see what's going on. Now, this is an old amalgam and that my number four wasn't cutting too well. So what I'm going to do is another burr that you can use is what's called a transmetal burr. It's just essentially a fancy fluted straight fisher burr. All those words, I don't even know what they mean, but I'm just kidding. So <laughs> they're... It's fluted, it removes amalgam really nice. You can also use diamonds, those are amazing as well. So we're just, what we're going to do is we know, we're trying to figure out along the way, while we're doing this access, you know, why did this tooth become necrotic? Really, that is the question. Is it because it's cracked? There's a large amalgam restoration. Is it because there's decay and we had leakage through the tubules? That's another possibility. So what, what am I saying? Well, let's remove some, now we're, gonna, we're not going to remove this whole amalgam. That'd be just crazy at this stage of the game. We want to get the patient out of pain and we want to move on. The patient does not want to, unfortunately, sadly, the patient does not want to spend time with us. They want to get this over with and get out of there. I agree. So what we're going to do is we're going to move some of the restoration here so we can see if there are any fractures along the pulpal floor. I mean, I, I'm pretty much hypothesizing this is, Symptomatic irreversible plitis secondary to, you know, decay, carries um, leakage to tubules and decay. So we're just removing that amalgam. And let's put this in two speed here, so we're not going to spend our time. So we're going to slowly remove some of the decay, but I'm using an electric handpiece. And for what it's worth, I love them. You can slow the handpiece down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually slow it down to around 60,000 RPM. I'm going back to my slow round burr, or it's actually my number four round burr. It's uh, at 60,000 RPM, and that's how I'm going to tackle this case. I'm removing some of the decay as we go, and then I'm going to slowly, remember I was talking about peeling away that onion? Well, watch this point right here. So this is our mesial buccal cusp, and we're going to slowly pop in, not pop in, but we're slowly going to get into that pulp chamber and we're just going dry. Look at that. There you can see the, you can see if you've never seen blushing before of a pulp, that is blushing right there. This is, but this is a good, not so much a good, this is intentional blushing. That's what we're looking for. So let's correlate that to, well, let's just keep going here. I was going to correlate that to the graph, but we'll just keep going here. So we're slowly getting into the, into the pulp chamber. And I apologize because I didn't, my phone is on autofocus at the moment. So it's going to go in and out, in and out, in and out. So what you're actually seeing there is actually the pulp stone, interestingly enough. Because I was like, what is that? It's dark. Well, what it is, is actually, let's take a look here. It's actually part of this right here popping through. So you'll see when we get back to that. That's the pulp stone. So this is the problem with these these. You know, then you're starting to see some pulp tissue here. This is the problem with calcified cases. You, you don't get that sense, that tactile sense of a drop. So you, again, the only way you can really tackle these are with high magnification. So this is that pulp stone. It's kind of that goldish, goldish color. And then I was like, okay, well, let's kind of, let's bring it towards the palatal. But what I've started doing actually, and especially in retreat cases, I've actually switched to a number two long surgical burr. And what that does is it kind of gives me more of a, a more exacting experience, if you may. So it's a little more detailed. And so you can see, let's go back here. You can see the pulp. So now we're certainly, we know that we haven't perforated because our burr, if we take a look at the shank, is nowhere near being 11 millimeters deep. Actually, that's the one thing I did want to show you. So an important thing that we need to talk about just you and I in this moment is Deutsche Musikant. And if you're, I really appreciate if you're a subscriber, you know I've talked about this probably almost every every video possible. And they talk about the distance from the mesial buccal cusp on both maxillary teeth and mandibular teeth. So on maxillary teeth, on, on both, from the mesial buccal cusp to the roof of the pulp chamber at six mils, the height of the pulp chamber is roughly eight mils. And if you're deep into the frication, you're at 11 mils. So using this and what you can correlate that to is the shank change the, the change of the shank on your long shank burrs so from the tip of the burr roughly from the tip of the burr to where it changes just a little bit up here 
Let's see if I can get it right here. So from the tip of the burr to roughly about here is six millimeters. So knowing that that burr is not anywhere near up by the, the, the hub, <laughs> we're not perforating. So that's a really important point that I wanted to bring up. So let's get back into this. So I switched to my number two long surgical burr and it gives me a little more precision. And just like, you know, when you're driving your bike or your car on the, on the road and you look, see a pothole and you look at it and you're driving right to it, that's what happens. That's what I'm doing right here, unfortunately, is I'm going, not unfortunately, but that's kind of my analogy. I'm going straight towards that pulpal tissue to kind of open it up and use that small burr to kind of unroof. So if you're not, if you've heard that term unroof all the time, uh, that's kind of what I'm doing. So what do we see here? We've got this pulp stone in the center of the tooth. Let's go back and take a look at what that looks like right here. So this is that pulp stone and we're kind of seeing it. It's like roughly, I would say we're kind of like right in this ballpark here. So let's go back here. So we've got, if this is our mesiobuccal cusp, palatal cusp is kind of, or mesiobuccal cusp, mesiobuccal canal is here. Distal buccal is going to be kind of over here. Our palatal canal is going to be kind of over here. And for MB2, which we all dream about getting all the time, and that's another reason why I put this, uh, you'll see later on in the video why I put this in here because of MB2. We're looking for a path around here. So this is that dentin shelf you may have to have to remove, or also, also known secretly as a dental cornice. I have no idea why it's called that. So we can use water. You'll see once my dental assistant rinses this off, you'll see a change in color. And when you're using, doing calcified, canals or calcified pulp changes like this, it's very helpful to identify walls, floors, calcifications, all ty types of different things. But, you know, unfortunately you need high magnification and you need really good light. So like I said, my, my phone's kind of in and out because it's on autofocus right now. So what we're doing here is we're just removing any more and I apologize, we're just out of focus, just a hair, it'll come back in, I think. So what I'm looking for is I'm seeing a little bit, because remember, you know, that pulp tissue, we'll just keep, let's just, I think we're gonna switch videos here in a second. So what we're looking for, that pulp stone is right in the middle of the tooth. So we're looking for pulp tissue, little remnants, little white stuff. It's almost like frayed clothes. Frayed clothing, that's what we're looking for around this. It's like those jeans that you keep going through the wash and they fray all, the, all over the place, you know, to look cool. Uh, I wasn't a cool kid. So it frays all over the place and that's kind of what we're looking for. So this video now is I stopped and we're going to pick up here. So you can see here, this is a new video. So we'll keep going here. And so this is all pulpal tissue that's hemorrhaging. You can see, I would say it's pretty irritated for that a little amount of pulpal tissue to start hemorrhaging. So what I'm using here is now I'm going to take my Munts burr. Yeah. So um, you can see here, it's my purple Munts right here. And, oh, that's right, we had the water on. Let's switch that off. We'll turn the water off, blow it dry. And then you can see actually what's really beautiful about this image is that you can see the difference in color now. So now that it's wet, we've got a little more golden for the pulp stone and the, the walls don't look as white. So what I'm doing actually right now, and I'll just, I'm sorry if I keep doing this, I'm looking, I'm gonna be troughing more towards the largest canal in that tooth, most likely will be the palatal canal. So we're looking for that because I'm using, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to kind of triangulate where my position is. Now I have a decent idea because we slowly made our way in, but once I get that palatal canal and I open up my orifices, sometimes it helps, especially in heavily calcified teeth to be able to figure out what the heck is going on. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm splitting, I'm splitting it between removing the calcification and kind of tracking along the pulpal wall. And that's all I'm doing there. I'm slowly making my way apically, nice and gentle, just brushing, nice and light brushing. And what you can do is you can have your dental assistant. So here you can see again, more pulpal tissue. It's around this, that honking pulp stone. Now you'll see at one point, I, I don't usually use ultrasonics. I find that they're, they're very, they're very precision instruments, but they're also, they're conservative. They're amazing. You can see around them, but they're also slow as heck. And they're very, they're incredible for certain specific situations. Uh, in my experience, I find that it just sometimes like big pulp stones, just cutting them out is just faster. It depends. I do have a couple videos that we do actually 
Yeah, in our MB2 Hunter course, there's actually a huge pulp sewn in one of those cases, and we blow it out with ultrasonics, but I typically don't have ultrasonics all the time. So we're slowly making our way, and all of this material here is pulp tissue. So those are the things that I'm looking for, the white line. So we'll rinse that out. Let's take another look. Yeah, so here I brought the ultrasonic in. This is one of those Buchanan tips, diamond coated. I, I just, I had it up and I'm like, you know what? This is, forget it. <laughs> I'll just take, I'll just do what I normally do. And the problem is, is that what I find with ultrasonics is that it creates heat. Um, if you don't have one and you start watching a lot of these videos and you're like, oh, I got to get one. But honestly, in 20 years of doing dentistry, I use it very limited. And those situations are very, very limited themselves, especially for primary Primary endodontic therapy. So you can see them just kind of, and you can, you know, put your, you know, I'd actually really appreciate it if you put your comments below if you do use ultrasonics. Um, I would continue with the ultrasonics if it picked up that, if that, you know, if that big rock in the middle, the, I call it the Great Wall of China. That's why I describe it to my patients. Your tooth has, a, has created the Great Wall of China. So that's how I'm trying to beat around it. So they understand it. If that started to dislodge with that ultrasonics, then boom, I'm set. But if I spend, you know, say two to three minutes with it, then I won't. So I'm not going to spend any more time. What I'm going to do now is because this patient was in pain, the primary thing I need to do is get them out of pain because today is just a pulpectomy. So you haven't seen me throw any hand files down yet, and I'm not going to for a while. I'm going to open the coronal two thirds, and this is part of my triangulation. When I, this is kind of my strategy that this is the, I was just kind of over time. It's like, wow, this is the easier way to do things. So I'm going to, the strategy that I'm using for these types of cases is I'm going to get an orifice at least one. And then based on, you know, basic anatomy that we learn in dental school on pulp chambers, kind of figure out where are the other pulp chambers going to be. Also included in this kind of strategy, I'll use that word because it kind of is that it starts to remove that pulp chamber, that pulp tissue. So I can start getting uh, irrigant sodium epicorite down the canal. So this is now it was able, I forgot to mention, I was able to see kind of where the dot of the uh, palatal canal opened. So what we're going to do is we're going to, I apologize for running off the screen here. Uh, we're going to open up that orifice as well. So what we're doing here with our wave one gold is that we're opening the coronal two thirds of the canal. And the benefit of that is it removes, again, it's part of that triangulation process, but also what it does is it allows me to get irrigant down the canal. So that's out of focus. Dang it. There we go. So it allows me to get, excuse me, irrigant down the canal and start degrading that pulp tissue because that's, you know, that's kind of the enemy right now is that pulp tissue that's been causing the patient some grief. So especially in the pulp chamber or in the palatal canal because it's usually got the most amount of pulp tissue and that causes the most grief, especially if you wait. So if, if there's any one tip you can take away from this, of this whole video, is to get the palatal pulp tissue out as quick as possible because that I find is the most difficult to anesthetize in symptomatic irreversible pul pulpitis, those large canals, same with mandibular teeth, the distal canal, any of those large ones. So when I was thinking about cutting this video for you, I was also, this was another issue that came up. I couldn't get, so there was something blocking over top that distal buckle. So you see my file won't go in and I was like, oh, okay, well, whatever. So what I need to do is I need to take my Munspur and open up the orifice. See, it's, it's just going a little bit, but it was just not going as much as I'd like it to. So my first, what I'll do after I see that is I'm going to, well, first of all, we need to rinse all this out. Let's, let's get some more hypochlorite in there. And one of the things you can do, a tip that was taught to me many years ago, was to bend your irrigating needle at a specified length so you know exactly how long it is every time. And it's really about efficiency. That's truly what this whole process, you know, as you become more skilled in dentistry um, and everybody becomes more skilled in different specific things, you know, you become, you've got just that routine. That's all it is. So the same rituals that you do. And one of my rituals is bending that irrigating needle at 18 mils. So I know every time I go into a canal, it's at 18 mils. Just one of those things. All right. So let's take a look at what we got here. We've got pulp stone. I've got, isn't that awesome? Look at this. I've got a... a a bleeding, a hemorrhaging canal orifice. So that tells me exactly where I am. And if we look at the anatomy, it 
mesobuccal cusp, distal buccal roughly around there, palatal cusp or palatal cusp is right here, palatal canal. So we're right in the ballpark. What I want to add as well as I've forgotten already, we didn't, I don't see any fracture lines because remember we removed that amalgam. So this I think is called a soffit by David Clark and John Cademy. If I believe that's, it's called a soffit, put it in the comments below if I'm wrong. And what we're doing is I'm not blowing out my access all the way to this. I'm blowing, but I am removing amalgam to make sure I can see, you know, any cracks or whatnot. But it also, you know, the other thing it helps for is also you don't have metal on your file when you're getting a working length. Look at that. Beautiful. It tells you where to go. All right, so let's see what we're going to do. So we're just going to trough over that distal buckle. Okay, so we've opened up that distal buccal orifice with our, with our Munz burr. And now you can see we've got a little bit less hemorrhage. Let's see what goes on here. I think I'm going to take... Oh, we're going to try the wave on gold. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And we just get a little more... That little bit just gave me a little more opening. And what I'm looking for is, is anything broken? I'm looking to see if that tip is broken off and I'm looking to see where it's cutting and it's not moving that well so I'm kind of like well let's get some files let's get some hand files down and then let's get our let's make a glide path because that the distal buckle obviously wasn't uh, it was a little more constricted than like say for example the palatal canal so what we're going to do here I think what I'm doing is I'm switching out yeah I'm switching out my high speed diamond burr so we're going to remove what I'm going to do is I'm going to manually remove this stone and the reason why i'm just going to play this so i'm just going with air i'm just going with wa no water just nice and dry and we're just doing a brushing technique so we're just removing that nice and gentle this is a long shank diamond burr you can see it right here so we're just removing any of that calcification and the reason why is that usually there's going to not usually i would say I can't even tell you how often, but there's going to be pulp tissue underneath that potentially. And if we leave it, it's going to necrose. So let's get all that pulp tissue out of it. Let's get that pulp stone out of there. Let's just take a look at our keynote. So you can see here, likely, unless this is going into the, you know, this could be the stone here. And this could be just pulp tissue. That's, this could be the, let's open this up. Get some, this could actually be the palatal canal. Who knows? It's hard to say. So you can see there's a stone there, but we're going to make sure we get rid of all that pulp tissue. And we're just using nice light brushing. You can try to blow this out with an ultrasonic, absolutely. I just find this will take a little bit less time, and then we're good. So what I'm doing here, and it's I apologize, I'm just off the screen, is that we're just, what I'm doing is I'm trying to open up where my mesobuckle 2 is just a little bit. You can see it's going to be right around there. So let's take a look. There's our or MB orifice. Oh, right there. That's where it is right there. There's MB2, potentially. So we're just planing the walls, getting this all cleaned up. Let's speed this up because it's kind of out of this out of the shot. There's MB2 right there, just opening up. Oh, actually, look at that little... Oh, right there, look at that. I feel like I'm watching a fishing video. A little bit of hemorrhage, indicator. My sons are in a fishing, so that's what we've been watching, lots of fishing YouTube. Okay, so let's take a look here. We've, we've cleaned up where this is MB1. This might be MB2. This little catch right there. Palatal is right there. And then we're down to, let's see here. There's our palatal orifice, and then our MB is right around the corner there. So I can always come back and refine my access, especially, you know, we're just doing the, the, the basics right now. You can always refine your access at any time. That's the beauty of endo. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have my hand in the way and we're just literally going to six, eight, 10 our files down a length. So we're going to watch wine a six file down the distal buckle. We're going to watch wine a six file down to actually all the canals. It's pretty straightforward because most of what I really wanted to talk about was getting around that big stone. 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to take an eighth file. We'll watch wind that down. There is a little hook at the end of that canal. So what I'm doing here, another tip you can do, actually what I've started doing because of my this uh, one of my students, G-Wagon, I've actually started using the bands on the on the, the file. It's actually faster. I find it's more efficient. The bands are, watch this file come out, and I'll tell you what the bands are. They're 18, 19, and these bands are 18, 19, 20, and then 22. These are 25 millimeter file, 25 millimeter length files. And actually I find they're, it's faster to look at the number, to look at the band number. So if you want to, you know, that's another thing you can do to increase your game. That's what I'm doing right here. I'm just kind of looking. It's at 19, I believe. Hard to see there. So I'm going to fast forward through all this because it's pretty basic. We all know pretty much how to hand file. We're just, wa not hand file, we're just watch winding files down to length. It's pretty straightforward. So then what we're going to do is we're going to finalize our initial working length with our number 10 file. So what I'm going to show you here is a little tip that I've learned a long time ago is that there's a hook. Actually, if I go to one red bar on the file, one red bar on the apex locator, there's a little hook and it goes towards the distal. So what I need to do, you can see it come out right there. See that little hook on the file? So what I need to do is, am I going to put that back in the miso buckle? Nope. So what I need to do, we're going to the distal buckle, but every time I turn it, every time I turn that, put that file in, if I go to one red bar, I need to turn it to the distal. But if I stick with just middle of the green or top of the green on the apex locator, I'm good. And I typically cut, I'm going to prep all my cases to just middle, like one millimeter, a millimeter short of one red bar. So a millimeter short of the apical constriction. That's really kind of where I've, where I've done it today. And <clears throat> this, I played with all different working lengths and I find that that at this day and age works the best. Okay. You can see it here actually. So what I'm doing here, and you see how that file will not go down. This is the, this is the purpose of the unidirectional stop. Boom. Watch that again. Okay. Oopsies. Sorry. So you see, there's a, a hook on the end of that. So if this is, this is what happens. If I go to one red bar, I need to have this bend. If I go to just top of the green on the apex locator, I don't need to engage that. So I take that in consideration, watch, boom, all the way down. If I don't have that, if I don't have that hook, let's see if I can start this here. My file will not go to length. Okay, well, we'll just do it there. So I'll place my apex locator. We're good. Okay, so let's get to the meat of this. All right, so we're going to, one of the key things, especially when you're doing pulpectomies or even a regular endo, um, what I'm doing, so what I'm doing here, I'm actually using the numbers, the bar, the bars, the bands on the side of the file. I'm not using the rubber stop. It's just a little bit quicker. And the key thing here is this is just an improvement. This is just increasing efficiency. That's all what I'm doing here is I've got my pulp chamber full of irrigant. You know, it's foaming up because sodium hypochloride degrades organic tissue. So it's becoming this foamy mess. And I'm using, so I'm bringing the file out and I'm cleaning the flutes in the irrigant, placing the file back down, cutting for, a, you know, a couple, one to, one to two seconds, out, back down. And you can slowly see the progression. You have to be very patient. If I don't see more progression, I'm like, oh, okay, we'll switch canals or I'll, uh, then I'll go back to a 10 file and see if my work, you know, we'll make sure we have patency. You know, the question I have for you, actually, I just had a discussion today with one of our dentists talking about patency and patency in vital, vital cases, patency in necrotic cases and patency with lesions. You know, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but go ahead and put in the comments what you believe. What have you been taught in school? What have you heard other lecturers talk about? You know, what is it? Because if you, we all look at Instagram, you've got such amazing skilled clinicians around the world. And they have these unbelievable cases that are perfectly patent. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest, man, that's really tough to do. And sometimes it's impossible to do. So, you know, put in the comments below because we can talk about that in another video series just about patency. Now, this is a vital case. Does it affect my patency? Mm, maybe. Am I able to get patent in all these canals? Yep. It was, this is actually a pretty straightforward case, just getting past that large calcification. 
So, oh, did you see that? So just put in the comments below about your patency. Now, see that hemorrhage right there? I had a video a while ago, if you Google, just how to stop a bleeding canal. And I can't remember if I talked about, because I've used VC sealer to stop sort of like what I would consider like a, a PDL bleed, you know, an irritated PDL. But sometimes if you don't open up your canal enough, large enough, wide enough, apical diameter wide enough, like a 4505 in this palatal case, you'll probably have pulp tissue all the way up and down that canal. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so I'm taking that in consideration. That little bit of bleeding tells me that I haven't, most likely have not cleaned out that pulp, that pulpal tissue in that palatal canal sufficiently enough. So I'm going to, and I'm only going to open up to a 2507 for this, this case. So you can see glide path was really simple. I'm just doing a couple. This is what we call smoothies, just smoothing up and down. It's also called filing, but who wants to use filing? All right, so what I'm doing here, so remember saw that bleeding? This is the palatal canal, which I remember is at 20 mils. And what I'm doing is I'm actually, sh I'm brushing the sides of the wall. Watch watch this tissue, watch this um, sodium hypochlorite here. You're going to start to see it turn red. What I'm doing there, the intent, now, am I, possibly hopefully doing it yes do I know exactly no but I'm brushing the intent is to brush the walls and to get rid of all that pulp tissue as much as possible because I am placing calcium hydroxide in this case calcium hydroxide will kill bacteria well a certain amount of them it's got a high pH there's still some more hemorrhage when I do that I'm like okay well I take it in consideration it has a high pH so it's going to degrade pulpal tissue but it's also going to kill bacteria at the same time now are there bacteria in this case probably because it's irreversibly inflamed but it's also a vital case too <coughs> excuse me it's like minus 30 outside today super dry too all right so we're going to be irrigating lots of irrigant lots and lots of irrigant let's see if i'm done i can't recall all right so let's take a look at what's going on here Mesial buckle one canal, distal buckle. Oh, we need to do MB2. And then there's our palatal canal. All right, MB2 time. Maybe that's the only reason why you're here. And if you're looking for MB2s, let me just throw this plug in here. I just created a new course called mb2hunter.com. You know, I've got the, the sites on MB2. And it's really, this, this course is designed, it's based, you know, it goes really well with, I think it goes well with the basic course of master root canals like an endodontist. But this is very specific for MB2s because it's a course I've been wanting to create my entire career. So I've waited. I've taken all these cases. And we talk about tackling MB2s exactly like this. We talk about using comb beam. We talk about a bunch of stuff. So we've had some good reviews. And I go ahead and take a look and uh, you know, MB200.com. So because we have time. So this is a, we're at a crossroads in this case. Say, for example, this has just been my experience. Go ahead and put in the comments below if it's been your experience. And, or if you disagree or agree, is that if you're out of time, chair time, you can leave, you know, it's almost like seven times out of 10, you could probably leave the patient like this, tackle MB2 at another appointment. If you're out of time, place your calcium hydroxide during your your pulpectomy stage. And I would consider this a, almost a, this is a 70%, uh, a 90% completed, except for MB2, I'll just leave that. What's three quarters, 75%, I guess. 75% completed uh, pulpectomy. So we've cleaned and shaped. So you can see that's actually one point I want to throw in here is that we've opened up the canals to a 2507. So we made sure that we've gotten rid of all of that pulpal tissue because that's what's going to save the day in this, in, this, in this treatment. And we've irrigated out tons of stuff. And if this was necrotic, we have, we've gotten lots of irrigant to our apical portion. And it's really tough if you try to irrigate. I've done it for many years irrigate through a 10, you know, a 10 file path. It's almost impossible to get irrigant down. Like I know you've tried it because I used to do it without opening a chrome two thirds. So you're, you know, you're like irrigating. I think I'm getting irrigant down there, but it's really tough. So I'd ra highly recommend any type of rotary reciprocating file with a larger taper than O2 during your pulpectomy stage. So to finalize, so what I was saying, like you could probably get away with leaving the patient if you're out of time or the patient is, you know, whatever the clinical situation is, leave the patient right now and close up and probably have decent success with this type of case. So MB2 is right here. 
And what I'm doing actually right, not there, I was doing it right, uh, I was trying to click, I was using my Explorer right here to push because I saw a little bit of debris. This is MB2 right there. And, you know, John Cademy in uh, Dentaltown calls this the, den the or MB2's orifice, uh, MB2's sucker's orifice of death. And the reason why is that if you try, you know, I've done it many times, is try to take a handful and put it in there. Maybe try to resist because I'll show you why. And you can do that. And a lot of the times it totally works, no problem. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take that number one month's burr. So it's um, a number one uh, round burr, essentially on a long stick. And I'm going to trough between, you can see all that white material there. That's just debris falling into an isthmus. And I'm slowly tracking that. Let me get my pointer out of the way. What I'm also doing is I'm cutting a little groove. I'm trying to be fancy for you guys. I'm cutting a little groove in the kind of little more coronal dent in here so I can get my, my uh, wave and gold file in there. But what I'm looking for is that white dot right there. That's like gold, not that other white dot. That's not it. But the other, that little white dot that you first saw, you'll see me try it. Now what I've done is I'm going to try to place a file in there. So I've opened up the orifice. I'm going to take my six file and what this does, and I've gone, it's hard to see because we're trying we're doing, we're taking three dimensions of packing into two. I've gone, you can kind of see in the angle here. I've gone a little bit down the canal, down the root, for example. And now the canal is a little bit straighter, meaning I'm not hiding. It's not hiding underneath that dental cornice, the dentin shelf. So when I first take a six file, it wasn't working. I was like, okay, so maybe there isn't an MB2. And I was like, oh, well, that sucks. I have this, you know, some decent footage, no MB2. I'm like, oh, okay, well, whatever. Take my Endo Explorer, kind of poke around there and try to see what I'm looking for. <clears throat> because I'm looking to see one of, the, one of the things I notice is that after I do this, watch. I'll place pressure. Nope. So I'll place pressure. In that area where I think the orifice is, I'll pull it off and I'll look to see if it wets. I find that if I've packed debris into an orifice or I've just I've uncovered an orifice, any of the fluid from that canal just immediately comes out just a little bit. It's very subtle. And I'm like, oh, there I am. But of course, I didn't get it in this case. What I'm actually getting is more just like I have a sharp explorer poking into Denton, which if you've done that before, it can be a little bit frustrating because you're like, oh. And then you go to take a file in there and nothing happens. So you'll see in a second, I'm kind of like, well, the Endo Explorer in my experience with an MB2 is not that useful, but little files are. So I'm going to take a, my six file is pretty flimsy. So I'll take a 10 or a eight file. I'm like, oh, I'll just start watch one and I'll place it in there. Nothing, nothing at all. But then all of a sudden, just like magic, what happened was it went in a specific angle and it actually, this is probably some of the debris. So it's actually joining. It was like magic. This was certainly by fluke. I don't have a comb beam for this tooth because it was an emergency walk-in. So you can see the file is angled and it made its channel and it's exiting into the MB1 probably about like five millimeters down. And I was like, sweet. Beautiful. I mean, what are some of the what are some of the tips that you can tell if it joins? Well, all of a sudden, you know, you watch one a little bit, and all of a sudden, it's like whoosh, the file. You can even it'll make that noise. It's just like whoosh, just drops down. Like okay, well, it's joining something else. So really, pretty much that little dot right there is what we're talking about, where MB two is, and it exits down around there. Wow, amazing, right? Well, yes and no. So it's kind of almost like a, a, I didn't want to get faked out. So I'll show you what I did to make sure that I don't have a split further down. So I have my 10 file in there. I'm just double checking to make sure I do kind of get it joined. You see how it just dropped? I'm like, okay, mint. And what I'm looking for actually in the primary MB canal, you can see it there is just a little bit of debris. So as I'm pushing, as the file goes apically, I'm pushing debris. So I'm like, well, Solve that problem. I'm going to take my wave and gold primary, and we're going to add some irrigant. Let's do that. Actually, there was a little bit of debris that just came out of there. Did you see that? Watch this. 
right there. That little ball of debris came out. I remember seeing that coming out of the MB1. So maybe not a solid indicator, but just another one thinking like, okay, they do join at some point. And then what I'm going to do is I tried to aspirate my ear again, but that I find that that's a so-so. If you don't want to talk about it, put it in the comments below. I can make a video on it. Absolutely no problem. I remember learning that tip in residency, and I'm like, wow, that totally makes sense. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take that wave on gold primary, and all of a sudden, you see how quick it drops? It's just like, phew, like that. I Actually, I heard the wind blow so fast, like the, the turbulence as that file dropped. But that's not good enough. What I'm going to do is not just drop it, but I'm going to use it to break up any of that remaining dent in between the two canals. So now we have just a single canal. It's pretty easy to do. That way, now we have, now I, I am like 95% sure that we have MB2s. The, I'll take another look because we did a, a pulpectomy. So we have MB2s found and cleaned out. Now, my question to myself is, is that really MB2 or is there, do they join and then split again? So we've cleaned out MB2, but I'm not sure if it doesn't split again. So I'm going to show you a little trick real quick in a second. And this is just a plug for this merchandise. So if you're looking for a Vertucci or wine classification coffee mug, I've got, I'm trying to figure out where to sell them. And, but the proceeds, the real point is the proceeds are going to a dental charity. That's the intent. Uh, you know, the, the little funds that it'll create. Cause not a lot of people want a uh, Vertucci classification coffee mug, but if you want one, I'll, um, slowly put up where I can figure out how to sell them. But what I'd really appreciate is if you have donated or a part of a dental charity somewhere in the world that is reputable and actually does some good work, because I've Googled a few and I'm kind of like eh, on the fence. If you have, you know, put in the comments below, I'd really appreciate it because um, I want the proceeds of these. There'll be a couple. There's going to be a wine classification mug and a Vertucci one. And you've made it all the way to this point of the video. So I'd really, you know, um, yeah, any help, I'd really appreciate it. So look for that. And, you know, what are we looking for in this case? Well, I'm really wondering if this is going to be a Vertucci type five. This actually really helped in this video because I have the wine classification memorized, but not the Vertucci type is a little more detailed. So I'm looking to see, you know, did, or do we have a Vertucci type one that goes straight down, which I think we have, or do we actually have another split? So Vertucci type five. So let's go ahead and let's see one quick way. Uh, apart from getting a comb beam, what you can do the simplest way is just take a small hand file. There's a tiny little curve. I probably should have a little more of a curve and I'm gonna run that down. And what am I doing as I have my unidirectional stop towards um, the, the paddle side of that canal. And we're gonna run that up and down just to see if I can feel any type of orifice. This is the simplest most cost-effective way of trying to figure out if your canal splits. You can use this in any other situation possible. I've used it in thousands of cases. The simplest way, just take a little bend and run your file up and down, and then you know your working length. So what I'm doing here is I'm watching my working length at the tip, so I know that like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm clear of the apex. There's no, there's no split. There's no split beyond the apex. So you can see there's more of a, of a curve there. You can use an eight file. I wouldn't recommend a six, pretty wobbly, but certainly at an eight or a 10. So I'm just running that along the palatal surface to see, because that's most likely where the split's going to be is along kind of that, um, you know, where the MB2 might be. So you might catch something, you might not. And another way, so there we go. We've got our, this is our tooth cleaned in shape. So we've got our MB1, MB2. There's our distal buckle, so full of, you know, bubbling. Bubble, the cauldron is bubbling over with our sodium epichlorite, just kind of like a witch's brew. And then we've got our palatal canal. We're going to do one final rinse with all this stuff here with our sodium epichlorite. And then we're going to dry. Oh, look at that. You can see right down. So I think we're probably, you might be seeing two-thirds of the way down, maybe the apical, third, apical millimeter potentially. Cool, huh? And we're gonna dry with paper points. 
So like I said, I've opened, so this is, you know, what I used to do when I was fresh out of dental school would be take a 10 file, maybe try to get a fit. You see a bit of hemorrhage on that right there? Right there. So I can't tell if that went long. Did I go long? Yeah, so we're at 20 mils. So the indicators are 18, 20, 22. Where am I at? So I might be actually long on that paper point. So let's take a look at that again. So a little bit of debris there. So what I'm doing is I'm stopping it right at 20, 18, 20, 22. I'm stopping it at 20, and I didn't get any hemorrhage on that. It's like a arrow, but it's going reverse out. So I know that... For the most part, that's not true. I, actually, still, you can have pulpal tissue in there that does not hemorrhage. It's been severed from the apical portion, but it's just laying beside it. So if we do have any of that, certainly our calcium hydroxide will take care of it. What I did there, actually, real quick. So I know that, actually, it's not very effective. You need to really put it at the working length. I'm just looking to see if my tip is dry. That's all I'm doing here is I'm bending it. You can use that to confirm your working length. I didn't in that case. And then what we're going to do is replace your calcium hydroxide. So there's our tooth, canals, big at the, this is four times. So the, everything you've been watching is actually, it's at six times magnification or 10 times magnification. There's our palatal canal. Um, we're at, so now we're back at four. These are actually three, uh, number three, number two size. They don't, I can't make, I don't know why they don't make them anymore. Number two size mirrors. That's why they're so, they're a lot smaller. Um, it's they're really easy to get back in the posterior. Now, need to remove, need to freshen this up. We're not going to today, but certainly we're going to place a full cuspal coverage restoration before potentially getting a crown, but we're going to freshen this up at the next appointment. And then we're good. All right, so next stage is we're going to place calcium hydroxide. So this is just UltraCal excess, essentially calcium hydroxide in a syringe. We're going to just place some in the coronal two-thirds. you got to be really careful. You don't want to extrude this apically. Uh, it can cause some damage. It's got a high pH. So I'm just going to place that in there. And then what you can do, I mean, arguably... You can use a lentulo spiral. You can use you can use a hand file to get it to length. I'm not really using this. You need to put something. There is an article, and if I can find it, it talks about. Um, you're just you're actually worse off if you don't place anything in your canals. Um, in terms of intracanal medicament, I use calcium hydroxide. Most of us use calcium hydroxide. If you use something different, please go ahead and put it in the comments. I'd be interested to know what you use, and then. You can spin it down with just a, you can put it with a hand file. You can use your rotary file. What I do, you can use a lentulo. What I've done now is I've just taken my wave on gold. It, so the wave on gold is a reciprocating file. I don't get paid by Densply. But if I spin it, it cuts in reverse. So it's a triangular sh rectangular shape. It cuts in reverse. But if I spin it forward, it's going in reverse. It's going, it's spinning in reverse for itself. So I spin it, for, anyways, at the end of the day, I spin it forward at around 1400 RPM. You can do that with your own regular rotary file. Just spin it backwards by hand if you're not comfortable. Just to spin down some of that calcium hydroxide. I'm keeping it approximately 2 to 3 millimeters short of my working length. Because I don't want to spin it apically. We don't want to do that. Spin it in because it could cause, it's very caustic. And then what I'm going to do is I'm not going to place a cotton pellet. I'm going to just kind of clean it out and I'm going to put my triage right on top of that. So we're going to use the calcium hydroxide kind of as our spacer. And the reason why I don't like to use cotton pellets, I do sometimes, is because you'll see it here. You'll see a little fibril. I'm going to come in for that little fibril right there. Nope. And right there, I got it. See a little fibril? There always is a potential, who knows if it's true, for that to wick bacteria into your case. Potentially, if you're you're using, you know, if you place your material, it, anyways, if it could wick, it could wick around it. What you can use is Teflon, roll up Teflon, just pack it in the canal, or pulp chamber, or I just use calcium hydroxide as the uh, kind of the block out. And then we're just going to place a restoration. And then this is triage, and then that's it. So we're going to get the patient back in a few weeks and finish this case. Anyways, I really appreciate your time, and thank you so much for joining me, and I'll talk to you soon. Cheers.